If you are building any kind of web API, you're going to need support for filtering, sorting, and pagination. So in this video, I'm going to show you how to implement these features and what are the best practices that you need to think about. We're going to expose an endpoint for fetching all of the products, and we're going to introduce support for filtering, sorting, and paging the product. So I'm going to start by exposing a get endpoint with the route of products and I'm going to make it asynchronous. For now, I'm just going to take in an iSender argument so that I can publish my query using Mediator and get back all of the products from the database. I'm going to create a new query instance, which I'm going to call the get products query. And right now I don't have this class, so we're going to be implementing it in just a moment. Then we're going to fetch all of the products by sending this query and we're going to return our products from the API by calling results.ok and passing in the list of products. Right now, this isn't going to compile, so let's go to the application layer and introduce our query. Inside of the products feature folder, I'm going to add another one for getting all of the products. And let's start by introducing our query. So this is going to be the get product query. I'm going to turn it into a record. And for now, I'm not going to add any arguments and I'm just going to implement the iRequest interface from Mediator and we're going to return a list of product responses. I already have such a response in the query for getting a single product. So we're going to just reuse it for our query that is going to fetch all of the products. If you are reusing response objects like this, it could make sense to move them into a separate folder or assembly so that you can share them more easily among your queries. So with this in place, if we head back to the endpoint and import the query, everything is going to compile nicely. And this is going to be a list of product responses that is returned by Mediator. Let's go ahead and introduce a respective handler for our query instance. So this is going to be the get products query handler. It has to implement the iRequestHandler interface from Mediator. We need to specify which query we are handling and what is the response of this query. So this response is going to be a list of product response objects. So that's what I'm going to specify. And now I need to implement my query handler and I just have one method that is returning my list of product responses. I'm going to use EF core directly for writing my query. So I'm going to inject the iApplication DB context interface. And now I can inject it from the constructor. And in my handle method, I'm going to start by making the handle method asynchronous. And let's create a variable for our products. Now I'm going to speed things up by pasting in a query that returns all of the products from the database and maps them to a product response. So nothing fancy here, just a simple EF core query. And now we're going to start introducing more capabilities to our feature. The first thing I want to introduce is support for filtering on the name and SKU values with some search term that I'm going to pass from my endpoint. So let's head over to the endpoint and introduce our first argument, which is going to be a string value for the search term. Now we're going to use this to apply a contains filter on the name and SKU columns and this is going to be how we introduce filtering. Now I need to be able to pass this into my query. So on the query object, I need to expose a property for our search term. And now we're going to use it in our query handler to add filtering. How you introduce filtering is by adding a where statement, and then you can filter the product based on your requirements. I said that I want to apply the search term filter on the name and the SKU of my product. The product name is a string, so this should be easy to filter on, and the SKU is a value object, so this is going to be slightly more challenging. Now let's say we only want to apply the filter when the search term is not empty. This also means that the search term argument could be nullable, so let's say we support not passing in a search term, so I'm going to make the adjustment to support for a nullable string in my endpoint and in my query. I'm going to make a few changes here and I'm going to grab the context products db set 
and try to convert it into a queryable. So this is going to be the product query and you can either call as queryable here or you can just cast this to an i queryable of product and this should work without a problem. The beauty of i queryable is that you can compose on the i queryable instance like adding a where statement or sorting before you finally invoke the projection and load the data from the database. So the first thing we want to do if let's say string is now our white space and we're going to pass in the search term and we really want to negate this. So when the search term exists, we want to update our product query so that it becomes product query with the where statement applied and the where statement we want to apply is that the name contains the search term from our query or the SKU value contains the search term from our query. So if you actually leave your query like this, you're going to run into an exception at runtime because EF Core will not be able to translate this query because of the way my SKU value object is configured. A lot of you working with rich domain models are going to run into this issue sooner or later. So I'm going to show you how to fix it. And unfortunately, the fix isn't really pretty. So my SKU value object is just a wrapper around a string value. And what I have to do is introduce an explicit operator that is going to cast my SKU value object into a string value by just returning the value of the SKU. And then when I go back to my query, what I have to do is take this SKU value object and explicitly cast it to the string through the operator that I just defined. And then I can ask if this string contains the search term. So this should cover filtering and let's check if everything is working. If I just send a get request to our API to fetch all of the products, we're going to get back all of the products in the database. And let's say I want to apply a filter on the search term. So I can do something like this. We need to append a search term query parameter and we need to give it a value of let's say product one, which should match this product here. Now, if I send this, you're going to see that the query executes properly and we get back some data. Let's try product two. So this still works. And if I just pass in two, I also expect to get back the same product because this is checking if the product name or SKU contains the character two in any place in the value. At the database level, your entire products table will be scanned to check the name and SKU columns for the presence of the search term. So this may not be ideal if you have a lot of data. You may want to introduce some sort of index that's going to speed up this query. The next thing I want to introduce to my endpoint is the ability to specify a sort column and a sort order. There are a few ways how you can approach this. Somebody could specify a string like this, let's say name ascending, and then you're going to sort the product by the name in the ascending order. To sort in the reverse order, you could pass in name descending and so on. So a different alternative could be passing these values separately. So you have one argument for the column and another for the sort order. And it's also important to have a default sort order because we're going to be implementing pagination later on and sorting is critical for pagination to work correctly. Let's implement support for this format here with specifying the sort column and the sort order separately. So we're going to introduce this at the endpoint level. So let's start by introducing values for the sort column and the sort order. Now you could say that these are required and make them not nullable, or you can make them nullable strings and then handle this at your query level to see what the default value is. Let's pass these values to our query object. So we're going to pass the sort column and the sort order. And of course, I need to introduce the respective properties on my query object. So this is going to be the sort column. And I also need to add the sort order. And now I can use them in my query handler to add support for sorting. 
you are going to need a way to select which column you are sorting on so that you can pass it to the order by statement. So if we check out the order by statement, it accepts a function taking in a product and returning the key by which we are sorting. I'm going to create a variable that is going to hold the expression that we're going to pass to the order by statement. So this has to be an expression of a function accepting a product and returning some sort of object where the object is going to be our property that we are sorting on. Let's call it key selector. And how we're going to get this value is we're going to write a switch expression on the sort column and then we're going to check whether the value in the sort column matches any of the supported sort columns that we want to have. So let's first add the default sort column, which is going to be our product ID. So let's just return the product ID. And now we want to check for the other columns that we have. So let's say if this says SKU, then we sort by the product SKU value and I'm just actually going to copy paste this and adjust it for the other properties. So let's say we want to have sorting by name, then we're going to use the name property. Let's also say we want to have price amount. So we're going to sort by the price amount and let's also add support for price currency. So we can say currency or we can just say currency here and amount. So whichever way you prefer, let's use this because it's simpler. I'm using lowercase values here, which means that if somebody passes in any uppercase character, then my columns are not going to match. So I can do a two lower call here before my switch statement. I'm applying this operator here to only invoke the two lower function if sort column is not null. Now that we have our sort column selector, we need to check for sort order. So I'm going to say if request sort order, let's also convert it to a lower string, is equal to descending, then I'm going to apply sorting in descending sort order, otherwise it's going to be in ascending sort order by default. And this is also going to cover the case if the sort order is null. So now our product's query becomes order by descending, and we're going to pass it the key selector, and of course we need to assign back to the product query value. Otherwise, it's going to be product query is equal to product query order by, then this is going to be in ascending order, and we're going to pass it the key selector. To improve the readability, I'm going to move this part here into a separate method, which we're going to call get sort column or we can say get sort property because we are returning actually a property value and we can even go ahead and just pass this here without an intermediate value and we can get rid of the variable here and just make this into a switch expression so let's say return and just switch on the sort column and you can even turn this into an expression if you want to. We're going to leave this like so, and this is what our query looks like now. So we have the filtering that we had before, we have added support for sorting, and then we are executing our query. So let's check if sorting is actually working correctly. I'm going to get rid of the search term, so we're not going to be applying filtering. I'm going to say sort column is amount, and the sort order is descending. So we want to sort all of the products based on the price amount in descending order. If I check out my response, you will see that the price here is 30. Then we have 25, 20, 15, and 10. So it seems to be working. Let's try sorting in ascending order and let's see what changes. So now we have the same products, but the price is sorted in ascending order, as you can see. And if I also omit the sort order completely, it's still going to be sorted in ascending order by default, which you can see when I send this query. Sorting and filtering seems to be working, so let's introduce support for pagination. Pagination is a technique to only return a subset or a given page 
from the database so that you're not loading all of the records from the database on every request. It's also helpful in user interfaces because you usually only care about the first few values and then you can narrow down your search if you need anything more than that. To introduce paging, we're going to add two more query parameters, which I'm going to call page and page size. So we're going to pass these to our get products query after sort column and sort order. And then we're going to use them to implement pagination in the query handler. So here I need to add page and then I need page size. The page number is typically going to start from one and page size is typically going to be predetermined on your user interface. After filtering and sorting on the product, we want to introduce paging. Paging is relatively straightforward. We're going to skip some records, then we're going to take some records and finally project everything from the database. How many records you skip or take is determined by the page and page size. So for take, it's easy. You always take the page size number of records. For the skip argument, you need to determine what page you're on. So let's say we start our pagination from page one. So we want to reduce this to zero for the first page and multiply by the page size. So for the first page, we're going to be skipping zero rows because one minus one is going to be zero multiplied by whatever is the page size. We end up skipping no records and then we take the first page from the database. For page two, we're going to be skipping one times whatever is the page size and so on until we get to the end of the table. If we take a look at this in practice, let's leave the amount as the sort column. So we're going to sort by the amount in ascending and let's say we want to get the first page and the page size is equal to five. If I send this request, I'm going to get back five records from the database. And now if I try to reduce the page size to two, I'm only going to get back the first two records on the first page. So now how I go further into my records is by incrementing the page size. So let's say I want to get the second page and I get the next two products. And if I try to get page three, I'm going to get only one product because I have a total of five products in the database. So paging is working, but this implementation isn't ideal. Right now, we are always returning a list of products from our query handler. Now this is missing some critical information like how many records are there in total because we are applying pagination and if the next or previous page in the database actually exists. So I'm going to create a helper class that you will commonly see if you're working with pagination and I'm going to call it page list. So what do we want to add here? So I'm going to make this a public class and it's going to be generic, just like our list is generic. Some implementations go ahead and implement list of T so that the page list is just an extension of this collection. I'm not going to go down this route because I like returning a sort of an envelope response which contains my items and then contextual information. So let's expose the properties that I want to return. So a list of T of items. Then we're going to expose, let's say the current page. We also may want to expose the page size. Then what could be interesting is the total count of all the records in the database. And then based on this, you can deduce if there's a next or a previous page. So if there's a next page, so let's call it has next page. How you can calculate this is by multiplying page and page size and checking if this is less than the total count of all the records in the database. And for the has previous page, it's much simpler. So has previous page, you can calculate this by checking if the page size is greater than one. If you are on any page other than the first one, then the previous page exists. Let me add a private constructor for my page list and I'm going to autocomplete this to accept a list of items, the page, page size and total count argument. And now how I'm going to actually pass these values to my page list is by exposing 
a static factory method. So this is going to be a public static method returning a page list of T. Let's call it create async because I'm going to be running some asynchronous queries. So I actually want this asynchronous and returning a task of page list of T. It doesn't have to be a generic method. And what I need is an iQueryable instance of T. So this is going to be my query. And I'm going to need the page and page size arguments. And now this method is going to do two things. So we first need to fetch the total count by executing this query and calling the count async method, which is going to return an integer value representing the number of products in the database. And now we're going to get the items for our list by applying paging. So I'm going to say query skip, and we're going to skip page minus one times page size. Then we're going to take page size from the database and we can call to list async. And finally, I can just return a new instance and pass in the items, page, page size, and the total count of records. How we are going to use this is if we go back to the get products query, I'm going to replace this with a paged list of product responses. Now I need to update my query handler to return a paged list of product responses and also my handle method. And now what I need to do is get rid of this part here. I'm also going to get rid of the call to to list async and product is now going to be an I queryable of product responses. So product responses query and we're going to use it to pass it to our paged list factory method. So products that we're going to return from the database is going to be a paged list of product responses. Then we can call the create async method and pass it the product responses query and also the page and page size from our query object. So let's pass in the page and page size. And of course, we're going to need to await this so that we can fetch the actual product. And now I can return my page list of products from this query handler. If we give this a try, let's say we want to fetch the first page and let's say the page size is five. We are sorting by the amount and the sort order is ascending by default. So if I send this query, I'm going to get back my envelope response. So here are my items, which contain the five items that I have in the database. And if I check the other values, you're going to see that we have a total of five records in the database. We don't have a next page and we don't have a previous page. So if I reduce the page size to two and I send this query again, now we do have a next page because we are on the first page, the page size is two and the total number of records is five. So let's go to the second page and keep the page size at two. We're only going to get two records in our items and we're going to have a next page and a previous page as well. This is how our handle method looks like in the end. We have the first part here applying the filtering. Then we have the sorting, which is dynamic based on the sort column and sort order parameters. And lastly, we are applying our projection. Then we have paging at the database level, returning a page list of product responses. If you want to see how to implement a CRUD API in .NET, check out this video here. Smash the like button if you enjoyed this video. And until next time, stay awesome.